I'm actually going to cover a case study on my first actual commercial real estate deal. It is the, we'll use the address as a case study, 1118 Garson Avenue. Super clickbait numbers right here. This deal cash flows me around $20,000 a year, but it did add $250,000, a quarter million dollars to my net worth, which is nothing to sneeze at, and also didn't have any of my own money. So in this case study, I'm actually gonna go into specifically how I found the deal, including the actual marketing material that I used to actually get this lead, and how I negotiated in terms of maintaining with the actual owner of the property, uh, the existing conditions in the property, and also what I did specifically, what my plan was, how I executed it, and the final results of that was I was able to buy a property, push its value, use none of my own money, be able to refinance the property and pay back my investors or credit lines that I used to actually finance the deal and also the improvements of that deal. So uh, without further ado, I'm actually gonna show you what this property looks like real quick. So we're gonna go to Google Maps and we're gonna go to sharing my window. All right, cool. So I just wanna make sure that this is actually showing on here. All right, excellent. All right, so this is what the building actually looked like back in 2000. I mean, I bought this I think in 2017, uh, but this is an accurate representation of this building here, okay? So it was a mixed use building, uh, four apartments up top, two commercial storefronts, and you can see, you know, pretty handsome looking building. I love brick buildings. I love buildings that, you know, this building had like, you know, tin ceilings and all that stuff. Came with a little garage behind here, which actually we have the first floor tenant uh, that is on this side right here using this. So anyways, how did I come across this deal to begin with, right? I wasn't looking for commercial. If you follow my journey, a lot of things that have happened in my business and in life have happened by accident. But Tony Robbins says success leaves clues, right? So I was actually using direct mail campaigns to target a neighborhood to source small multifamily deals, right? I wanted to buy stuff that was anywhere between two units to let's say six units. And so this person or seller was on my list. I generated the list from, I believe, list source. And also I used a program called, not a program, but a service called Quantum Digital. I used kind of like combinations of direct mail postcards and also yellow letters, or I used white letters actually, because I think yellow letters was just really kind of, I don't know, I, this just seemed cheesy because I was generating thousands of these at a time and it looked so fake in terms of yellow being on the front side and white being on the other side. So, to, so it definitely did not come out of a notepad, but I digress. So this is the actual piece of mail that I sent. And as you can see, it looks horrible, right? I used an actual template that was on Quantum Digital's website. But one of the things that I did do it to stand out, because a lot of these marketers that are wholesalers will just use the standard yellow letter, I will buy your house all cash, I'll buy your property all cash, close quickly, I'll pay closing costs, all that stuff. And there's, you know, people will get lots of these. And there's nothing for them to stand out. So I figured, okay, let me stand out by kind of adding a personal touch to this. I had a picture of myself and my wife standing in front of our house and we're looking to grow our real estate portfolio, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this is the piece that I used. It went to a property that was in the Pearl Megs Monroe neighborhood, which is actually adjacent to our neighborhood right now, where we live right now. And this guy called me and he said, I don't want to sell the property you mailed me about, but I do have another property, which is a mixed use property in the North Winton Village neighborhood, all right? And so I was not really keen on buying a mixed use property. Owning a, uh, a commercial kind of scared the crap out of me, but I was at least intrigued. So, and I figured if I was to build a relationship on talking to him about a property that I wasn't interested in, that I would be put, putting myself in a position to, to buy the properties I was mailing him about. So I never bought those properties. I still keep in touch with him. You'll learn actually why I still keep in touch with him these days. He actually became an investor of mine, but this is the building. So I walked here. Now, the reason why he was selling, unbeknownst to me, is that he was having zoning issues with this property. Why was he having zoning issues? It was because he had maintained these two storefronts when he bought the property and always had a hard time finding tenants that would stay or pay him rent uh, in these two commercial storefronts. This is a commercial property that is smack dab in the middle of a residential neighborhood. As you can see, this is not a big commercial corridor by any stretch of the imagination. 
And so uh, he decided, okay, I'm gonna turn this storefront right here into an apartment. And in order to have an apartment, it would not feel very safe if you were living in an apartment on the ground floor with a storefront like this and having your bed right here, okay? Uh, living in a fishbowl, right? So what he ended up doing is he ended up taking out the storefront glass and closing it in and putting these two kind of like transom windows and kind of just like closing the whole, you know, the whole damn thing in, all right? So that got him in hot water with the city's zoning department because you cannot close in a storefront and convert a commercial unit to a residential unit without actually upgrading building codes and all that stuff. So the city was harassing him, was fining him, was wanting to have hearings and all this sort of thing. He went for a zoning board of appeals and got denied by the Zoning Board of Appeals, and this was causing him a lot of pain, which leads me to my first kind of lesson on this. Well, one, first lesson, your marketing stuff doesn't need to be too cute. It can be kind of raw and rough and native looking uh, and still be effective. And then uh, number two, no pain, no sale. Remember that adage, no pain, no sale, all right? When people own investment property, if it is riding all smoothly and that sort of thing, and there's nothing wrong with it, and they're collecting checks and that sort of thing, they're not apt to sell it, or at least at a price that would make sense from you from an investment standpoint. So um, anyway, so I walked the property and uh, I kept in touch with him. Uh, and I was asking him, what does he want for it? And he said me the same old adage sort of thing, make me an offer, all right? I'm still working on the Zoning Board of Appeals thing, and uh, if I get the Zoning Board of Appeals through, I might not sell the property. Well, he got denied, he called me back, and was still hesitant to sell the property. What he ended up doing is he ended up actually renting out this space here. The city basically put down like a, like a cease and desist for renting this out residential. He rented it out to a commercial tenant that was actually a mobile veterinarian clinic, so which you're actually to see on the rent roll. So those are the existing conditions when I walked the property originally. I got some interior pictures. It looked like the property was pretty well maintained. And it was tough actually getting him to give me a number and actually giving him me a physical walkthrough of the property. He wanted me to make him an offer that was, that was acceptable to him. When I asked him what, it, what, what he wanted, he said, make me an offer. So anyways, I kept in touch with him. And then finally, I kind of like, my instinct started to serve me in a different way. And I was like, hmm. Maybe this guy, you know, he's always takes my phone call. Maybe we should just have a face to face over a beer. Because at this point in time, I just like I never really had, you know, belly to belly time with him. So I was like, hey, Paul, why don't we get together tonight, you know, and get a and grab a beer and talk about this deal. All right. So I had uh, a beer, maybe three. We got a little bit of inebriated. And I said, you know, Paul, I'll give you, if you don't give me a number, I'm just gonna give you a number that's, you know, that works for me. All right, so I said $150,000, will you take $150,000 for this deal? And so he said, no, I think it's gonna have to be higher than that. So literally I was like, okay, what about 160,000? So he's like, no, still not doing, <laughs> doing it for me. So there was this back and forth. And finally I said, how about $190,000, but I want you to hold the mortgage on the property because we have this zoning issue with the property and I cannot get financing on a property from a bank if it's got a zoning issue. I'm prepared to take care of this after closing, but you're gonna have to hold the paper for five years, okay? So we had a handshake, uh, we made a deal. I was at his office the next morning and we I brought the paperwork with me and we filled out the paperwork. It was basically a fill in, the, uh, fill in the blank purchase and sale agreement, which is perfectly fine to do on smaller types of deals like this. And so we negotiated seller financing that was a 22 and a half year amortization with a five year term. And I think the interest rate was something like five and a half percent or whatever, right? So then the, uh, in terms of the due diligence materials, the first thing I requested was a rent roll. So I'm actually going to share my screen again. Let me just reshare and come back here. And I'm going to, I'm gonna go to my entire screen. Okay. All right. So we're gonna get a, we're gonna get out of that. So, all right. Cool. So this was the rent roll that was originally sent to me. Actually, no, that's not the rent roll. This was. Let me see here. Ah, here it is. Okay. So this was the rent roll when I first bought the property. About thirty-seven thousand dollars a year in gross rents based upon the current rents. When I looked at the property, I definitely knew that these rents for here were way below market. There was rent comps down the street that were, you know, trading for anywhere from $750 to $900 a month. 
So I definitely knew I had some value add in there. The units actually were in fantastic shape. All they needed maybe was some paint. The former owner definitely kept good care of it, kept the apartments updated. This was like workforce housing, right? People that had good were good jobs were you know maybe working sort of retail or uh, slightly blue collar jobs and that sort of thing, which is perfectly fine. Great credit, all that stuff. So. Um, this was the current rent roll here. So I knew that I had some value add uh, to put into this uh, property. Now, how did I overcome the fear associated with these two units right here being commercial? And like, you know, a lot of residential investors are absolutely terrified of commercial, right? What if a, a unit goes vacant? I've seen storefronts with a sign in front of the unit uh, window for 10 years. What if that happens to me? So how I really got over my fear associated with this is that I look, took a look at, okay, well, these people didn't have a lease that was coming right up soon, so I knew that I had the time in order to be able to bring these rents up to market rents. And if I did that, these two storefronts could be vacant, right, forever in perpetuity, and the property would still uh, break even, okay? And then I would be paying down debt and that sort of thing. So I was like, okay, what's the possibility that these two storefronts would be, remain vacant forever? Okay, I, th I thought very minimally, but worst case scenario, I was gonna be coming out with cash out of my pocket, okay? So, moving forward from there, um, I ran an analysis on, on it, and this is the spreadsheet that I use. And so, I basically, I, I, we bought this property for $190,000. I'm not gonna actually go into that, but I plugged in some historical financials on here, and my debt service was going to be around $23,000 a year, and this net, net operating income was, you know, 28,000. So we had some, you know, we were able to do this deal and it was not breaking even from day one. We had some value add component and that sort of thing. So I was able to increase the, the value from $190,000 to $330,000 over a 12 month period. And this is how I did that, is I brought the rents from what I just showed you here up to this amount, all right? The only capex I really had to do in the property was actually to solve that zoning issue. Remember, this was the great pain point for this for the seller. All right, so I was able to solve the the pain point there. This is actually what the property looks like today. I had to take out that these walls that enclose the storefront and have a new storefront built. Right? Sounds expensive. It wasn't cheap, but it was around uh, nine thousand dollars to get the storefront rebuilt. Okay. I basically gutted out the entire unit. That was an additional 1,000, like 1,000 to 2,000 dollars, including the dumpster. It wasn't that big of a demo. And then I just put it out on Craigslist and I started deleting Craigslist ads, reposting them, deleting, reposting. Got a lot of inquiries on it. You have to be very selective about retail tenants. I got one that was actually a property management company, and so I was like, okay, property management company. They're not depending upon foot, you know, foot traffic because this is not a heavy retail corridor and would be a perfect thing there. They own a bunch, I mean, they own and also manage a bunch of properties around the area. They have use of the garage. So it was a perfect fit for them. And also they took it in as is condition, which is actually why I made a rent concession on here. I knew that I probably could have gotten a thousand dollars a month, but they put probably about $30,000 into the space and they signed a three year lease, right? So they put $30,000 into it. I gave them a concession of the rent at 650 per month. And it was, um, uh, it was a good it was a good deal for both parties. This is what I like about commercial is because it feels like a partnership, right? As opposed to residential. So I was able to bring those up there. I actually have a copy of the pre, the appraisal, so you can see get actually how the numbers were ran on this property. If you want that, if you want that, definitely shoot me a message. I can actually send you over that appraisal, so you can see how that looks. Or better yet, you know what? I might actually just put a cop, put a link to it in the in the description below, just to save you that stuff, so you can actually take a look at it and uh, for yourself. So. So that being said, fast forwarding today, I was able to bring this property back, not today, but to actually about 12 months later, I was able to bring this property back to the bank. I was able to get a $330,000. No, now backing up, I said I did this deal with none of my own money, right? So this was a $190,000 purchase. The seller wanted me to put down 20%. We had minimal amount of closing closing costs. It was a, it was a few grand in closing costs. This is great about doing a seller finance deal is that you, know, you don't have a bank attorney involved, you don't have appraisal fees and all that sort of thing, right? So uh, there's $38,000 down. We had to put $9,000 in for the storefront. And then also we had a few thousand, a few thousand bucks for additional closing costs and that sort of thing that was on there. So it was about 50,000 bucks altogether. 
all right, that I had to come up with. Well, I used a business credit card. I opened up one. I, I was establishing business credit for a long time. Pro tip, if you have an LLC, the first thing you want to do is open up a business credit card, okay? You may not get the credit limit that you want right now, but that's going to actually help you establish business credit and be able, when you apply for a uh, one of these 0% down credit cards that are like 0%, no, 0 interest for 12 months, then you can get bigger and bigger lines of credit and be able to do stuff like this. So I was able to pull that from an actual business business credit card line of credit, it was 0% interest. I knew I was able to ex execute this strategy in, in one year or less, just to be able to get my money back, right? So it a, appraised for 330,000, I got a loan on it for 80% loan to value. They gave me about $264,000 in, in terms of a loan. Remember the seller, held a mortgage of, of it was 80% loan to value. So we got loan proceeds of 264 and let's not just even 264. All right, so we're 190 times 0.8. Okay, so 152 and then minus 264. So, oh geez. So this is 264 minus, oops, 264,000 minus, see this is really raw people. <laughs> I'm doing my, my my trashy math with you on this calculator here. So minus 152. Okay. So I had $112,000 in cash out potential on this property. So I was more than able to get the $50,000 back. And I was actually able to take the difference of that. So if we take 50000 from that in terms of getting my money back, I was able to take an additional $62,000 of cash out of that property and stick it in my pocket tax free. It's a beautiful thing about commercial in terms of being able to scale rapidly. I was able to buy this property for 190,000 and scale it to to $330,000 in less than 12 months. Right? Not only that, I still own this property to this day. I'm actually going to show you the rent roll right now as it stands. Okay, so right now I was able to remember we were able to take this from uh, 46,800 a year in gross rents. Was able to increase the rents up to 53.35 uh, per month, and so I actually did the analysis right here. I updated the spreadsheet, right? So we pushed it from that to $64,000 a year, and it, now we have a net operating income that's about $40,000 per year. All right. If we take a conservative conservative 8% cap rate on this property, and we go over to here. This property would appraise right now in the mid five hundred thousand dollar range, right? That's a you know over a quarter million dollars of value that was created in doing this deal, right? So this is the type of stuff in terms of scale you can do when you are uh, concentrating on commercial. So let me just get back to my home screen right here. So hopefully this was a value to you. Oh, let me back up a little bit. Um, yeah, this is another pro. This is another pro tip. Very important. Listen to this right now because this was a major, major thing that kept me up at night with this deal. I was naive. This is the first time I bought a commercial property. I was not familiar with environmental due diligence. And on any property that you're buying that's not 100% residential, even if you're buying five units plus commercial multifamily property, you're still going to want to have a a phase one environmental assessment done or at the very least a uh, transaction screen or also known as a T screen, okay? Um, with an environmental consultant. I didn't need this because I was like, well, we're not using a bank. The seller is gonna be the bank. So why do we need a phase one? All right, so I skipped that step. What ended up happening when I brought this back to my bank is that they wanted to have a phase one environmental. And that phase one environmental was about 1800 bucks that I had to pay for. And they came back and it was like, hey, there was actually a history of a dry cleaner being at this building. If you're not familiar, dry cleaners are one of those environmentally sinful businesses in terms of they have a history of using some pretty nasty, nasty carcinogenic chemicals in dry cleaning. So that was actually something that was I wasn't expecting. So it prompted for a phase two. And I was like, what's going to happen? Now, phase two is generally where they have a environmental consultant will actually take soil samples. They'll do borings in the actual uh, slab of a prop, uh, slab of the basement, that sort of thing, and around the property to take soil samplings and also air quality samplings to determine if there's any uh, ad adverse environmental impacts, right? So this was an additional $7,000, which I didn't account for. 
and also multiple weeks where I was like up at night, just thinking about this, stressed, not knowing what was gonna happen. My banker at the community bank was like, you know, told me, he's like, Matt, I'm actually worried for you and how this is gonna pan out. I was also thinking about, okay, do I need to contact the guy that was the private money lender, private, not the private money lender, but the actual mortgage holder and saying, hey, we've ran into some issues here. I might need to, may need to extend the loan. I know we were at a five year term, but I need to may push this out to 20 years if this is something that we can't cure easily. By the grace of God, the phase two came back clean. All right, so crisis averted. The main things that I got out of this deal was one, it was able to, I was able to get my feet wet and commer commercial with buying something that wasn't just multifamily in terms of business that I understood, you know, really, really well at the time. This is about seven years ago, but also it allowed me to really, really take the fear out of the commercial asset classes like retail and office and that sort of thing. So it opened up the doors in terms of building my confidence level uh, going forward. So that was definitely a huge value add to me uh, as part of this deal. And then thirdly and lastly, which is really, really cool, is I performed for the seller. I paid him his payments like clockwork via ACH every single month while he had that loan in place. And so, and I got him his money back. Got him his $180,000, dollars in money back. And so he became actually a great investment partner of mine that we've done deals in, in the future after that. And we'll continue to do, do deals as well as I'm raising capital for you know, five, $10 million deals in terms of either being a private money lender or an equity partner in those deals. So that was really powerful as part of this deal too. So I hope you got some value out of this and I hope you enjoy these case studies. I have many of them I can do. Certainly if you got value out of this, please put some comments below. Let me know you actually liked it and I can actually do more if it's a value to you to actually wrap your mind around stuff and it's not just so conceptual. Also drop some questions down below that I may have not covered in terms of answers on here because I didn't do this thing scripted. I just actually went through my memory and went through my old files and stuff like that. So definitely uh, reach out if you do have any questions, put them in the comments below and I will be happy to help. In the meantime, go big or go bigger.